brain tumours, the glioblastomas. <clears throat> and the, the, this all started uh, with an idea actually from you uh, about medicinal cannabis <laughs> and they put a little idea into my head and then I was at a NEMA conference and when I was presenting there, so was Charlie Teo. And afterwards, I went up and talked to him and I said, this is an idea that I have. I want to actually look at there's, there's in vitro and preclinical studies that are done on glioblastomas and medicinal cannabis. And there's a one study that's actually been done um, in Spain that looked at it intratumally. So there's potential for medicinal cannabis to be an adjunct treatment for reducing tumour growth in glioblastomas. And he says, let's do it. So that then started me into this role of um, setting up the protocol. How can we actually do this? And it took me two years to um, get the funding, to actually have everything ordered, getting all the ethics, having everything in conjunction to actually start um, for it. But it's it's hardest trial I've ever had to <laughs> put together and do. Um, but it's also probably one of the most emotional and, and worthwhile trials. Now, you just mentioned there about intratumoral delivery. Yes. I know what that's got to do with, but is there anything that you can let us know about that sort of delivery and where that's going? Yeah, there's, um, fortunately there was only the one study that was done on nine people and it actually showed uh, good tolerability, it showed reduced growth and, and survivability, but the ethics of getting the ability to directly mm. put cannabis into the brain, yeah. it hasn't gone anywhere. Yeah. It doesn't been... happen at home. No, it doesn't happen at home. And nobody do this at home either. <laughs> Don't do this at home. <laughs> and <laughs> However, the person who's studying it, which is Gomez, is actually um, still conducting further studies, I know, straight into it. Although in saying that, I've actually had people ask if, if, if it's a bit, uh, they can actually have it done. So that's really not going anywhere. What is actually going is more the oral ab application yeah. of it. And there's been one study that's already and still being conducted by JW Pharmaceuticals on side effects over in London on survivability, um, although not published at the moment, but it's still showing really good results. And then ours is the, the first worldwide to be able to show tolerability and efficacy. Right, so you're looking at tolerability and efficacy. Can you discuss a little bit about the endpoints that you're looking at? Yeah, absolutely. So our main endpoint is the FACT BR, which is a quality of life. And what we're doing for each person, it's an individualised. So we do a, a titration process that slowly goes up to where they're actually, they'll tolerate that particular dose. So all of that is actually documented. Then our other time points are an MRI at beginning and end to actually show efficacy if there's uh, tumour reduction or how, what the tumour's done on the RANO criteria. Then we're also doing all of the, the national cancer criteria on toxicity. So we can actually look at all the um, interactions and side effects from both there. A lot of them are obviously undergoing chemotherapy as well. And a lot of the studies have actually been done on temozolomide and medicinal cannabis. And there's been no studies at the moment that's been done on other treatments like lamustine or avastin. Um, and we have people in our trial that have actually been on them. So we're actually right, going to have okay. the first time there's actually going to have data yep. to actually show uh, those. In yeah, what's going to happen. What's going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> so, so going back to it, we can't discuss it. So, um, I can give you some information oh, can on you? it. Yeah. Oh, okay, all right. But can we just discuss a little bit or can, can you just tell us a little bit about the hurdles that you've encountered <laughs> with regards to the setup? Because you've got not just getting it across the line with an S8 drug that's not a drug. You've got then, you've got to um, uh, or liaise with staff and get them on side for the delivery of this, for the, for the concept of the trial. You've got statistical analysis, you've got recruitment, you've got all these sort of issues, um, as well as delivery of the actual drug itself. Tell us a little bit about what you've encountered and what sort of herbal hurdles you've surmounted. Oh, conducting trials on medicinal cannabis is probably the biggest... Why are you grey? No. I, I am. <laughs> I've gone grey. <laughs> and I have gone grey continuously <laughs> from this trial. And the, the, I thought it was a beautiful ash colour, but anyway. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'll take that as a personal yeah, yeah, compliment. No. But uh, some of the biggest... <laughs> Some of the biggest hurdles is, is massive because, you know, this is actually a plant, but considered to be a scheduled S8 mm. because we're dealing with a higher THC component. Now, when the, I'm going to start all the way back to actually when you choose what are you going to use for this. Mm. 
And in saying that, so we have to have a look at what is the different ratios, what's the potential, what's the research actually said. So from that, we've actually chosen one in one and a one in four. Now, um, I'm, Justin has played a huge role, as have some of the staff in biocuticals, in helping to source this all over the world to find the right type of genus, like the five species, and then the manufacturing of it and how it's actually put together. Now, that may sound easy, but it's actually not. And because a lot of the, the formulas that are actually made are not manufactured properly. And they also have added things in there because when you do certain manufacturing, you'll actually take out some of the terpenes. So then they'll put in things like rosemary oil that's got certain terpenes. It's not actually right. medicinal cannabis. Um, or they'll put in certain flavours. So it's not a real whole plant extract. Mm, and mm. then it also depends on what, where I just said, like what type of the plant that they actually use. So it took us a time to actually find a manufacturer who actually did it. No products that are currently on the market suited our trial. So we had to find someone who would actually then manufacture exactly the products that we wanted um, in the ratios that we actually wanted, um, being organic uh, and a whole plant extract. So that in itself is a, the first hurdle. The second hurdle is that um, yes, it's been legalised in Australia, so we've got all the TGA guidelines, but then every state has its own regulations as well, which you actually have to go by. And it's so much easier to conduct a trial on opioids than it is on medicinal cannabis. And number one is because each of the, like I said, number one, that, that product yeah. has to have a, its own COA. Now, if it's standardised, it's OK, because the, same, the COA is always the same. Now, if you get a second batch, the COA may not actually match, and then you actually have to put that all the way through both the TGA, the, the health government right. and stuff as well. <clears throat> so you actually then have to then also put it through ethics again, so as an, as an amendment. So and that's another $500, as well as waiting for them to come back. So that makes its own complications. The medicinal cannabis itself, uh, trying to get it into Australia, you need uh, the Office of Drug and Control, so an ODC, has to be uh, set from both the manufacturer, the person where it's actually going to be stored, how it's going to be stored in a Schedule 8 facility, how it's then also going to be transported from the, the facility to the pharmacy, and which pharmacy has actually done that. It has to be then signed off. Of that, All of that needs to go to the ODC, it needs to go to the, the, health, the Ministry of Health, it needs to go to TGA to have that all organised and set. So this all has to be put into place and stuff for it. And then every time it actually gets documented, the pharmacy then also need to have a policy and a person that's actually there to be able to sign off of it yep. and account for it and show where it's stored. Yep. In addition, if it's actually destroyed, they actually have a destroying um, procedure, which we had to all write... Uh, with them. So it's all new stuff. It's all new stuff. And this pharmacy had never had it before. And to actually destroy medicinal cannabis, you actually need to have a police officer there to watch you destroy it, sign off of it, and then it has to go onto the Schedule 8 things, of which they all actually have to watch. But you not an opioid. To, but not an opioid. I know. Don't worry about the SA problems. Don't problem. worry about the SA problems <laughs> and stuff like that. So we also had other hurdles in the pharmacy that because of the pharmacy in the hospital it only had a small scheduled eight safe that yeah. could only hold 16 bottles which was not enough so then we had to figure out uh. because it obviously costs so every time you actually have to transport it because you've got all the transporting people from the um and i'm going to like honestly biocuticals and particularly anna and belinda have been absolutely oh, amazing <laughs> in organizing this but they then have to organize it from going from the air, like that facility to there, and that costs money. But then yeah. we also have to relabel it because coming from Canada, it has to come with the original label on it. Then it comes here. It's just a nightmare. I know. <laughs> and then because then we actually have to put the trial label on and make sure that's actually the case. So then it has to be relabeled before it can be taken to the pharmacy. So and this is all before it gets to the patient. Yeah. So <laughs> let's jump to that because so you've got tolerability. Yeah. Um, you've got acceptance by patients of a you know it's in the, and known in the community as an illicit drug. Yes. What about getting other doctors on site? How, how open were they to the, the, the concept of the trial? 
that's really interesting. Obviously, Charlie is the one that's there. He's the one that's prescribing. We've had a really mixed response from the medical doctors because everybody actually on the trial, we actually have to contact and have to make sure that their medical team is okay with them being on our trial. So that means all their, their surgeons, the medical oncologists, the radiation oncologists, and their GP has yep. to be aware of them coming on to this particular trial. And by ethics, we also have to then send them out a letter to say that this person's actually on the trial, this is the potential side effects that they may actually see, and this is the, the regulations in it. So that goes out to every one of their doctors. Yeah. So in doing so, then we've had a really mixed response in uh, whether they are actually happy about it or they're not things. We've actually had about 10 people who their oncologist said, no, I don't want you to be on this trial don't want you from there so from that they're, they're not allowed to be on the trial right we've had other ones who are very interested to see um, and most of it is just most of them are sitting back watching right um, and then you mentioned earlier about using the whole plant extract when you're talking about this entourage effect which I've discussed previously with Justin mm. and might be applicable really that term to all herbal extracts which it's is all herbal extracts yeah. it's every um, herb has its own entourage because what we've actually found and in a lot of different studies that each herb is best as a whole plant extract versus a complete little isolate yeah and this is well, like Daddy Mieri talks about this yes, as well absolutely. But, but when you're getting that and you're you're thinking about a reproducible product you're thinking about something that you can scientifically validate now and later how do you reproduce a whole plant extract exactly when you've got climatic changes soil changes with growing area age you talk about um, some of the um, cannabinoids uh, degradation products with age how do you do that when you when you've got a plant like it makes it really difficult, and that comes down to your manufacturing and the ability of putting things together. But in the same, it's never going to be exactly the same. You know, Didi Madiri knows that there's 144 different, or well, over 144 different cannabinoids mm -hmm. in it, but that's not including all the terpenes and all the other constituents that comes around. And because we've really only focused on CBD and, and THC, they may not actually be the beneficial components yeah. that may be having the, be the best outcome. So that's one of the hardest things at this stage and because each batch can actually be different it's going to be really hard to standardize as a standalone drug and it's one of the reasons over in america they started developing the synthetic forms which they then found like if you look at all the studies they don't have the same benefits yeah, yeah. so we there's going to have to be a new um, understanding of herbal plant medicine in traditional conventional medicine yeah yeah i know this is and crystal pharmacy. And fancy. I know this is crystal ball gazing, but what's your hope for the future for cannabis um, with regards to its use in glioblastoma? And I mean, you could go elsewhere with other cancer, but let's just pinpoint it to glio. Um, uh, with regards to Australian treatment, like, it, it, does this have the propensity to be taken, for instance, to rural areas where we know cancer patients get poorer care? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we're doing a big study actually on real cancer patients at the moment. But my aim and my the thing I would really like to happen is that we get this as uh, one of the conditions that uh, practitioners or clinicians can actually prescribe for. At the moment, that you cannot prescribe for cancer, you cannot prescribe for brain tumour. Um, and with all the discussions that I've had with some of the higher medical oncologists, because of such the poor outcomes of any of the treatments to date on glioblastoma, if we can actually show an increase of 20% in quality of life, yep. this will actually be looked at as a potential condition that uh, doctors can actually prescribe medicinal cannabis for. And I, from here, I've also been in discussions for the next trial as a phase three type trial with multi-centre, but this will give us so much more information. And we're, we're, I've actually just put in another ethics application to look at genetic swabs um, for the metabolites of uh, the CYP450 enzymes. Right. Um, and if I can, I'm not sure if I can yet, but tissue analysis. So we might be able to use a simple test, even like a swab, to identify people who are going to be more effective more for cannabis. Risk. No, more, oh. more of benefit. Oh, right. Um, because we'll be able to correlate that with um, people who've actually had tumour reduction uh, within our actual trial or other benefits as right. well. So it'd be, again, that more personalised um, treatment Medicine, option. Yeah. So in the next one, if we can do the test, we can actually say, well, this person's going to be more of benefit. Yeah. Then we can put them on this particular ratio 
and, um, and then do the slow titration to t- tolerability. So it, for me, it's actually really exciting. And if we do that and we can show that, there's high likelihood that we might be able to get on the PBS for people with gliomas because the cost is inhibitive. I dream of the day that we actually can see cannabis as an option for uh, a, a, a treatment option for patients suffering Absolutely. not just brain cancers but other cancers as well on thing, on you know websites like EBIQ in Australia. Can we can only dream of the day.